Dr. Walsh, thanks for coming on the FitMind podcast. Oh, pleasure to be with you. You've studied the mind from so many different angles, and um, I was hoping you could just give us a kind of brief roadmap of the journey you took to where you are now and your understanding of the mind um, in terms of like where you've studied, what you, you know, what you've come across, um, just as kind of a, a big overview to get us started. Okay, well, it's been a, a long and intriguing and, uh, <laughs> and uh, many times mysterious journey in which uh, possibilities and perspectives opened up that I really had no idea existed. I come from Australia. I did my medical school training and a PhD in neuroscience in Australia. I came to, uh, to the States, to Stanford University, to study clinical psychiatry. And uh, as part of my clinical psychiatry training, I went into psychotherapy. I was doing therapy on people. I wasn't terribly convinced it was particularly perfect, effective, but I figured I had a moral obligation to try it myself. And uh, I had one of the greatest shocks of my life. I found there was an inner universe as vast and mysterious as the outer, which, and that uh, it w contained reservoirs of uh, potential insights and ways of acquiring knowledge and depths and riches that I had not even guessed were there. It really felt like I'd, I had lived my life on the top six inches of a wave on top of an ocean that I hadn't even realized existed. And as I looked around at the world, it became apparent that most people were also unaware of our inner world, our inner universe, and didn't know how to access it. In fact, our whole culture was effectively divorced from our inner experience and the potentials and capacities that are available once we begin to tap into those. That got me uh, started on a, on a long personal and professional journey of exploring different ways of uh, understanding and training and honing and developing and cultivating the mind. And those range from um, my continued neuroscientific research to uh, West, of course, Western psychology and psychiatry, clinical uh, psychiatry, psychotherapy, but also increasingly in, engaged in uh, contemplative practices, meditation, yoga, contemplation, and exploring, to my great surprise, the Indian psychologies and philosophies and religions that I had just I formally dismissed religion as the opiate to the masses, but again, gradually began to see that behind the conventional institutions and the myths and the dogmas were a small, little known uh, subset of people and practices designed to train the mind so as to induce the same states of consciousness, insights, realizations, and virtues that the great founders had discovered. And it just blew my mind to realize that that, that was depth and dimension of religion was available to us all, yet almost completely unknown at that time in the West. I mean, a little better understanding now, but still not much understood. Yeah, it, it's incredible. And I, I want to, there's a couple of points you made there. I want to unpack a little further for the listeners. Um, the first is just that a, a lot of the inner world that you mentioned is kind of goes unnoticed and our culture doesn't really, we're kind of projecting out there into the material world all the time and, and talking and thinking about our circumstances and, and we spend very little time looking inward. And so that vast world of inner mental states isn't really apparent until you take the time to sit down and observe it. Um, and then as you mentioned, because this might be news to, to some folks, um, is just that the world's religions are um, built a lot. Most of them are built on top of of experiences that people had that are seem to be kind of innate capacities of the mind. Um, and so while there's definitely a lot of dogma and um, kind of superstition in, in some religions, there's also just these core human experiences of, of altered states of consciousness of kind of peak experiences or whatever you want to call them that are accessible to the human mind. 
And so I really want to explore those in our conversation. And we can also kind of do it through the lens of shamanism, which um, in your book, I think you said it was like the world's oldest religion, if we want to call it that, or maybe, maybe let's just start with what is what is shamanism? Shamanism is, as you said, uh, often described as the world's oldest religion, dating back as far as you can tell from from Paleolithic studies, uh, some uh, probably 30,000 years at least, uh, possibly longer, possibly associated with the great cave art of uh, uh, the caves of, for example, Chabot in, uh, in uh, France and elsewhere. And the shamans were the first to find ways to systematically alter consciousness so as to, to De- become more sensitive to certain kinds of experience, which they found rendered them more effective in helping and healing others. So shamanism is uh, is a tradition in which people use uh, inducers such as music, rhythm, dancing, uh, fasting, hypoglycemia, sometimes exposure to cold and uh, and in some cases, uh, psychedelic drugs to induce altered states of consciousness in which they uh, they have experiences which they feel uh, allows them to access uh, different realms of experience in which they are able to obtain information and insights that are valuable for their tribe and for their patients. So the shamans are kind of a multifunction function people. Uh, uh, the uh, you know, do it all all role in society. The, the, the healers, the the contemplatives, the the uh, mystics, and the the supposedly you know for, seers or fortune tellers. So, you know, they combine lots of different roles. But <clears throat> some of it sounds at first glance pretty weird, but as we've begun to understand the psychology of uh, the ways in which they induce old states of mind and the way they begin to use their own inner resources, then it begins to make a bit more sense. One of the things that was fascinating that I learned from your work is just how prevalent this was. I think you said it was like every every hunter gatherer society or like every society that um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's, it's, it's widespread to the point where everywhere from Siberia to the Amazon jungle, it's uh, it's common amongst different cultures. And so it doesn't seem like it was all coming from being passed down from um, common groups. It, it seems like it may have sprung up naturally and, um, been discovered separately in in a lot of these different cultures. Is that right? Yeah, I think you've summarized that well, Liam. Yes, this is uh, shamanism is a tradition uh, which really does uh, extend around the world and was was found, still is found in every major continent except Antarctica. And clearly is something which has been discovered and rediscovered across the centuries which suggested it, it taps into some innate potential in the human mind, some capacity for entering altered states, for having these kind of experiences, for accessing inner wisdom and being uh, being a valuable resource because it's, uh, it's not impossible, but it's hard to imagine it survived for 30,000 years across most of the globe uh, if it doesn't, didn't have some functional significance and value. So these altered states of consciousness, like when... when you use that term, I think for a lot of folks, it'll conjure up uh, uh, like psychedelic states. Um, but it's, I think, less well known that you can also enter altered states with a lot of the methods that you mentioned earlier, like drumming, music, um, uh, different rituals and fasting. Um, and just humans have come up with an incredible amount of different ways to enter these states. Um, so, like, yeah, what's the real value of doing that? Why do you think that's such a, an innate human drive? 
Well, all of us have access to altered states of consciousness. In fact, we move through them each day. We sleep at night and we have dreams. We have dreamless sleep. We wake up. And during our waking time, we our state, state of consciousness varies. Sometimes we're kind of drowsy. Sometimes we're very alert. Sometimes we're really clear. Sometimes fuzzy, etc. Uh, and each of those uh, and different states have different capacities. And, and so in the West, we have known for a long time about, for example, hypnosis, in which people can be, uh, can have access to very valuable capacities, such as being able to reduce pain or to develop uh, strength, strength, physical, even physical strength temporarily. Uh, or various qualities of mind. And so that's one way we've known. You mentioned psychedelics, and that was the, the big, uh, literally mind-blowing experience that the West, contemporary West had some 50 years ago when uh, LSD was invented. And for the first time in Western history, a significant proportion of the, of the population started having very dramatic altered states for which we as a culture were totally unprepared. And there, there were unfortunately a number of casualties, but there were also a large number of people who reported that their lives were significantly and dramatically enhanced by those experiences. And uh, if you run research studies on subjects, as is now being done, a significant proportion of people who have those those experiences under carefully controlled circumstances, etc., will report uh, profound insights, uh, therapeutic breakthroughs, and uh, and uh, deep understandings of life and themselves. So, so that's one example. But what we've but that what we've now come to understand is that over history, human beings have appreciated the value of altered states. Uh, for example, deep concentrative states where one can really focus very precisely and carefully in a sustained way and in that way um, develop certain certain qualities of mind such as calm and clarity. And, and uh, we've also, uh, well, there's a lot of different states, but we've found that or rediscovered or recognized that Techniques such as meditation and yoga and Christian contemplation and Zen and Jewish uh, Jewish uh, Kabbalistic practices and Sufi practices, a long, long list, have been around for centuries, if not thousands of years, because human beings appreciated the value of these very specific states of consciousness and the capacities they could bring. And now we're beginning to map these psychologically and neuroscience and appreciate the enormous benefits that, for example, meditation can, can produce. And we literally have now thousands of scientific reports demonstrating the sometimes very dramatic effects and benefits and therapeutic uh, gifts that meditation can induce. In fact, uh, advanced meditators have now demonstrated uh, over 20 psychological capacities that psychologists either didn't even know about or thought were impossible. So that's pretty dramatic. What, what are some examples of that? So first off, <clears throat> advanced meditators are able to uh, perceive with enormous sensitivity and clarity so they can pick up tiny cues that the rest of us miss, such as in uh, in interacting with other people. When we're interacting, when we're dialoguing, there are constantly these shifts of facial expression that go with the different emotions we're experiencing moment by moment. Most of us only kind of vaguely register those, but advanced meditators uh, pick them up with uh, exquisite sensitivity, and in fact, are even more, more sensitive uh, in reading people's emotional states in the form of experts or the people who were thought to be best who were CIA agents. <laughs> so, uh, so there's that deep sensitivity. Uh, another extreme would be uh, lucid dreaming. All of us have had, the, had dreams in which we have suddenly become aware we're dreaming. And 
those are called lucid dreams. People who uh, cultivate meditation practice are able to develop those, uh, their capacity for lucid dreaming and to recognize their dreaming and then use their dreams to both uh, heal themselves or uh, have deep insights into the nature of the mind and themselves and to free themselves from old habits. And so lucid dreaming is, an, is another capacity. Um, deep, uh, deep introspective sensitivity, the capacity for really being in touch with one's own emotions uh, and motives, which you know, most of us, uh, to a significant degree, run unconsciously by motives and emotions we don't recognize. It's possible to, and if, to the extent we do that, to the extent we run by our minds, we're basically kind of like automata. But we can develop our sensitivity and come to recognize the motives and emotions that are arising, and then we have a choice. And we can choose whether we want to go with them, whether we want to release them, explore them, or just let them pass. So uh, much more control and, and capacity become available to us with these, these kind of practices. And then they, uh, these practices foster psychological development. One of the most, in my mind, one of the most exciting discoveries of the last 50 years is the fact that psychological development doesn't have to stop at the same time the body stops growing. We can keep growing and maturing throughout life. And psychologists have now mapped out the so-called stages of adult development, moving through, and what happens, we move through what are called pre-conventional stages. We come into the, into the world without you know, an understanding of the world or, or society or conventions or how to live and act. We're gradually enculturated and move up to the con conventional stage. But which we thought was the ceiling of human possibilities. Now we know people can move to several post-conventional stages. And as they mature through these post-conventional stages, they become more sensitive. They become capable of, of recognizing and responding to greater richness and complexity in the environment and in their interactions. They become capable of responding more skillfully and appropriately. And people at these post-conventional stages uh, have more satisfying lives, deeper lives. They're not necessarily a lot happier, but they can be a lot more effective. And for example, if you, among top business managers, most of them tend to be in these uh, post-conventional stages. So that's just a small list of the many, many changes and benefits that we've uh, discovered in the research from. From meditation, of course, there are similar benefits, somewhat different, but similar from, for example, Christian contemplation or uh, you know, Confucian, sorry, or Taoist yoga or Indian yoga. It's a it's a very rich research field which uh, is just exploding at the moment. It's definitely a, an exciting time to be able to have access to all those different teachings and and all that different research at the same time. Um, I feel like that perspective allows us to start to parse out like common mechanisms. Also bringing it back to shamanism a little bit, like um, it seems that one of the, the difficulties and, and you do a good job of looking at this from different angles in your, in your book is just to like, what, is, what is making these techniques successful? Um, like how do you distinguish effective tools from mere superstition um, and also like to what extent is or even expectations and beliefs playing a role in the effectiveness of the methods at times it's a really tricky issue and I'm curious uh, how you how you think or how you would summarize kind of your view on that on that yeah, it is tricky and uh, maybe before diving into that I just want to emphasize a point you made in passing which is that is that uh, this is the first time in history we've had all these different contemplative practices available to us. And so, as you said, this is the first time in history we can begin to look across the world's uh, accumulated reservoir of wisdom and insights into how to understand and work with the mind and cultivate our capacities. 
and look for what, what are the common elements. Spirituality, uh, it's going to be a tricky word for people, but essentially for that I meant uh, what uh, the world's traditions regard as most central and essential for living a full human life. So, and as I wrote that book, Essential Spirituality, the Seven Central Practices, it became really clear that Yes, we could for the first time identify these common practices and begin to make sense of them uh, psychologically and see why these practices work. And as to your uh, questions about how do we discern what practices work and why and what is just super superstition or misunderstanding, and what is due to uh, expectations and placebo effect, that's one of the great research uh, endeavors of our time to first off find out what are the really effective practices in any tradition. You mentioned shamanism and that's one, uh, but it's true of any discipline, whether it's Western psychotherapy or uh, Indian meditation or Chinese Taoist yoga or any of these traditions that, you know, there are reservoirs of wisdom here. There are invaluable practices that we're just beginning to, to mine. And a lot of them come encased as, with lots of dogma and superstition. And so the, one of the great challenges of our time is to parse out what's really effective from what's overlay and distraction. And that is going to, you know, we have some partial answers. You know, we have most, most answers for by far for meditation with yoga, a close, a close second. But it's going to be a long project to really get clear on that. I'll just give a, a real world example of a recent trip that I just got back from uh, in Peru where I went into the Amazon jungle and I lived with these three shamans. Um, it was myself and, and one friend and, and these three shamans on an island and they were doing ceremonies uh, for us. Like we were ingesting ayahuasca and, um, and I felt incredible afterwards. Like I was 10 pounds psychologically lighter and they said you know they said they were healing us um and they there were things that they were seeing that we couldn't see but one of the incredible things was that all three of them seemed to be on the same page as far as what they were seeing when they when they took ayahuasca um and then they were you know they were singing these songs that they said they can only sing when they're in the ceremonies so there were all these things i was witnessing that just didn't really make sense with my worldview um, like a specific example is that the Tita, who was the the grand, like the eldest m member of this tribe, was also giving ceremonies in Mexico at the same time. And there was a point during the ceremony where they said, you know, Tita is with us. We can see her. She's right here and she's helping you out right now. And, and it's, you know, it's just, I, I don't even know, like that doesn't fit into my worldview and I'm still struggling to make sense of it. But I'm curious from like a from your perspective and f from maybe just like a psychological or like pragmatic perspective, um, how can we understand like what does that tell us about the human mind? Well, the the clear answer is we don't know. Uh, you know, we don't know how to interpret that. We don't. You know, that's a that's an interesting experience and claim. But there's really no way of establishing the validity. We can take their word that they had that experience, but was it was it suggestion? Was it a hyper suggestibility of a psychedelic state? Was it a parapsychological uh, experience? We really have no way of knowing. And one of the and that, and that's okay. There's one of the qualities that's really important for a lot of things, including psychological uh, well-being, maturity, growth, and for investigating other cultures, 
and investigating other practices and investigating unusual experiences is to hold what's called epistemological humility, which epistemology is the study of how we know. So it's holding humility about what we know and how much we can know and recognizing that at bottom, life is a great mystery. And you know, there's just an awful lot we don't know. There's an awful lot we can't know. And we do what we can to create a little light in the <laughs> light in that vast uh, uh, mystery of, of, of not knowing. You know, the greatest scientist in, in human history, many people think, was Isaac Newton. Uh, just you know, brought you know, science had emerged just in the last couple of centuries. Galileo had discovered you know, the laws of motion on Earth, and Kepler had discovered the laws of motion in the in the in the skies, and Newton brought them together in a unified explanation, which just was an unprecedented intellectual achievement. And he was clearly one of the greatest if, uh, geniuses who ever lived. And he gave a beautiful, just an exquisite summation at the end of his life. It's beautiful. I memorized. He said, I do not know how I may appear to others, but as to myself, I seem to have been just a little boy playing by the seashore, ever now and then finding a brighter pebble or a prettier shell, while all around me the great, great ocean of truth lay undiscovered. It's like, wow. That's the great one of the greatest minds of human history. And he recognized that the most profound discoveries of his has been just like little seashells or pebbles and all around him was this great ocean of mystery. Uh, so it's a good attitude for us to hold as we explore anything in life. And uh, it, it's not only a, an appropriate and accurate understanding the way things are. It also serves us well. It keeps us humble. It keeps us open-minded. It frees us of dogma. So that just seems a very useful stance. Well, we're not. In fact, there's a whole research field on that. Uh, it's called by various names, such as the intolerance of ambiguity and uh, <clears throat> the Ziganic effect, which is the need for some sort of intellectual or conceptual closure or, or perceptual closure. You know, the mind's wired to want to want to interpret things and nail things down, which is, makes sense if you've got to be sure you're seeing whether you're seeing a lion or a, you know, just a random movement in the grass. But uh, but it also has its costs and. As people, one of the characteristics of psychological maturity is, is that people mature, they tend to become more comfortable with not recognizing and acknowledging that they don't know. And unfortunately, in our culture, that's kind of a sin. You know, what do you mean you don't know? You don't have an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. Well, yeah, everyone has an opinion, but it doesn't mean they're right. In fact, the more opinionated people are, the less likely they to be right. What can we take from shamanism if we were to think about well i know it already is making its way into into the kind of western context with neo-shamanism but um like what are some of the lessons we can learn and how we can and the tools we can use and bring to our cultural context well there are there are a number first <clears throat> first one we've been talking about is that Exposing ourselves to these different traditions and cultures opens our minds up. That alone is <laughs> can be healthy. I think a very practical thing for uh, we can uh, open to in shamanism is the recognition that it's possible to have very deep and meaningful experiences and altered states of consciousness very rapidly through very simple techniques such as a combination of listening to rhythmic music, being in a in a group setting, uh, movement, dance. Now we've rediscovered that in significant ways uh, over 
time. That's, uh, that's been known for a long time, but what hasn't been known is that we can then use those states that come from rhythm and dancing and fasting to induce uh, beneficial therapeutic healing experiences and insights. So you know, we can not only go to a rave, uh, for example, you can, in, you can have those same kind of uh, uh, very moving, powerful experiences and direct them towards healing and helping others, for example. So there are potentials in these commonly used practices, such as music, rhythm dancing, that, that uh, uh, not so widely recognized as yet. Yeah, and, and one of the areas that kind of brings a lot of those together that you talk about is uh, ritual. And I was thinking about how we still have rituals in our modern culture, but they seem less intentional. And, you know, maybe that's contributing to this kind of loneliness crisis, but it just seems like we have less um, bonding rituals. Yeah, I think I think that's a very important point, Liam. And it was one of the things which struck me as I wrote the book, you're talking about the world of shamanism, you know, which put out in a couple of editions. So I spent several years writing and rewriting that book. And uh, you know, over that time of creating the world of shamanism, it really, uh, one of the, that was one of the things that struck me is the power of ritual. I realized I had underestimated how powerful ritual is. And, uh, and yet there be, can be, something very potent about uh, about using particular sets and settings and communities and ritualized ways of coming together and interacting that have their own power and that build up over time. And, and particularly if you add in additional elements, such as maybe some of the listeners have done a for example, being guests at an American Indian sweat lodge. Well, you know, and I, in my naivete, thought I was going in for something like a nice sauna. Well, boy, did I ever get that wrong. I had no idea how powerful it was to be in the dark, in intense heat and steam, with a group of people who were sharing their deepest aspirations and prayers and going through ritual, listening to drumming. I mean, it just blew me out of the water to find out how incredibly powerful it was to be with people sharing their deepest hopes and fears, aspirations and prayers. And in a setting where there was some sensory deprivation on the one hand, there was intense heat, so one's defenses were kind of melted away and it just it was a mind and heart opening experience way beyond anything I'd estimated. And I just realized I'd been incredibly naive about the power of ritual as you, as you wanted to. Yeah. Do you, do you think we're like, I'm trying to think of any times where we are, are trying to do that in our modern culture. Um, I guess even something like a family dinner is technically a ritual, but um I don't know if anything comes to mind. Well, I think, yeah, and thank you for bringing us back to this topic because I think you're making a very important point that we are a, a, a de-ritualized society that uh, throughout human history, as far as we can tell, and across multiple cultures, humans have noted and ritualized and sacralized various life uh, stages and events. Uh, puberty being, you know, childbirth being one, of course, puberty being another, menarche, that where, where girls have their first menstrual period being another. Um, these were traditionally ritualized and honored, and the, pers and the person was acknowledged as making a major life transition, so they were supported, encouraged, authorized to see themselves in a new way, to take a different role in, in the community, to step into the, in the case of a, an adolescent ritual, coming of age ritual, step into their mature 
potentials and capacities and give themselves permission to, to take on the stance of a responsible adult. And we just don't have those now. We, you know, some people are trying to revive them, thank goodness. But this is an important lack you're pointing to. And uh, it would be beautiful if we individually and collectively took greater time to note and sacralize these major life transitions all the way through to dying. You know, in our present time, when people get a, get a life-threatening diagnosis, it's usually all about medical treatment. And that, of course, has its, has its place, but there's also a place for, and there is starting to emerge the so-called death doula role where people are trained and skilled in, in holding the dying person and, in, and caring for them in all possible ways. But in addition, helping to reflect on their lives, helping to, them to come to some sense of completion, uh, to transmit any wisdom they've learned. You know, it's a very beautiful and sacred role. So ideally, we would have rituals at each stage of life from birth through to death. And uh, hopefully we will see more of this again because we really truly need it. Yeah, and we're, we're so interconnected yet, at least in our kind of Western culture, we've become so uh, indi individually focused. And um, I, I feel like there's this default uh, belief system that's running in people where it's almost like the e like egoism, we could call it like this new religion of the self and pumping the self up on a pedestal and, you know, look at my accomplishments and, you know, it's all about kind of the, the me, the me, me culture. And um, one of the things that just becomes very clear in the world of shamanism is, is the importance of narrative and uh, mythology and just having like a, an empowering, like sto the value of stories and myths and the role that those play both for shamans, but also just like for, for societies in general. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk about that with you. And, and you also made this, there was one line in there that just really got me thinking about how we need this new myth that's appropriate to our time and needs. And um, I, I wanted to see if you had any ideas on what that could be. Well, <laughs> First off, uh, to acknowledge the importance of what you just said, that yes, we, we live not only within our own worldview, but within our collective worldview, and not just as a static set of beliefs, but as narratives, as stories. A lot of the ways we uh, understand ourselves is through the life story or so-called life myth or self-narrative that we create about who and what we are and where we came from and what we're becoming. And we do that as cultures also. We have, for example, the American myth. We are this somehow chosen uh, country and that we are special and let's face it, we think we're better than most of the rest of the world. Uh, whether the rest of the world agrees is another question, but, but that reflects an underlying psychological fact of, yeah, all of us like to see ourselves spe as special, and that translates out at the societal and cultural level too, and translates into our cultural and, and national myths. And those are being challenged at the present time as we, as we are facing uh, more you know, directly the being forced to confront a history of racism and genocide and how do we fit that into our cultural myth and understanding and narrative. Acknowledging that, yeah, we've done some wonderful things. We've also done some pretty terrible things in our in our history. And you know, that's you know, one can say that's human part of human nature, but can the way we relate to that is what's most crucial because we can either, as some people are doing, such as the uh, Texas uh, legislature is trying to erase some of that negative history from school textbooks, 
or we can open to it and learn from it. And that's what ideally one does with the past and one's mistakes. One learns from them. So, so yes, we are in a, in a phase of, of individual and cultural transition. And yes, we are in need of new worldviews and new myths or narr cultural narratives, which take into account you know, we, the myths we inherited were the religious myths, you know, and those just don't hold up, you know. You know, it's like, yeah, now that everyone's got a video camera, let's see someone claim they parted the Red Sea. Well, you know, now a significant proportion of people believe that. That's the so-called literal mythic stage of belief. But for the most people, that no longer holds. And, you know, science, science is giving us in incredible amount of information about the world and ourselves, which we need to incorporate into a new understanding, a new story, a new myth. And that is being born. And there are many competing uh, myths uh, floating around. And so you ask, could I point to one? Well, I, I, I of course, I can't because I don't know how things will turn out. But I can point to some of the characteristics of a healthy collective narrative and, and global narrative. First off, I think our narrative will have to be a global one. It will have to include our entire human civilization. This is boundaries now just aren't what they used to be. Second, it will need to include our scientific understanding of the world and ourselves. But it won't be an exclusively scientific understanding because, because our understanding of ourselves and our, our lives and reality also comes from our deep inner experience. It comes from the ways we communicate and language and what's called hermeneutics, which is the way we translate uh, communication and many other sources of information. So, and it's going to have to include multiple states of consciousness. The fact that we can access different kinds of information in multiple states. And it's going to have to include multiple levels of psychological development, not just assume everyone's on the, at the same stage. So this is a vastly richer understanding of ourselves and reality than we've ever had before. And the new narrative that's being born and the new worldviews that are being born are going to have to expand to include all these. And they're going to have to be open-ended. They're going to have to be open to ever new discoveries and insights and ever richer and further potentials. And they're going to have to rest in mystery, the recognition that in spite of everything we know and everything we will know, we will still rest in boundless, bottomless mystery. That's, that's my best guess. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a beautiful description of where we're at. I don't want to end. Uh, denigrate uh, people who are are religious because I think it's it's also beautiful to have a belief system and just not need um, not need a reason and just have faith. But most people are do need um, evidence and and they do take into account like the scientific worldview and such. And so there's this vacuum being created when the religion when religions or just blind faith in whatever our elders tell us is replaced with the need to figure it all out for ourselves. And each of us does have to figure it out because there's no, there are a lot of competing different narratives and myths out there. And unfortunately, a lot of the ones that it seems like it's just way easier to spread a, an unhealthy kind of negative uh, narrative, unfortunately, but I, I am optimistic that a more yeah, a healthy one could win out. Let's hope, pray, aspire that you're right, that a healthy narrative, uh, healthier, growthful narratives and, and understandings will win out. And it's, uh, it's going to be a race because, as you pointed to, uh, there are now we're facing novel kinds of uh, multipliers for negative information and disinformation and, 
and our social media is largely wired to amplify uh, messages which are, are negative, which inspire intense emotions of fear and anger and jealousy, etc., and which basically, uh, you know, for, for Facebook, for example, an angry, upset, in, poorly informed person is a much better customer than someone who's calm, collected, informed, rational, deliberative. Uh, they're just not likely to stay as long on Facebook. And it's all about, you know, that we're in the so-called attention economy. So and the attention economy is wired and, and favors uh, unfortunate characteristics. So it's a race. It's a real race between consciousness and catastrophe. And of course, that's you know, the context of our times is that we're facing a very real possibility of civilizational collapse as, uh, you know, due to the environmental, ecological weapons, uh, et cetera, et cetera, factors. That, and, if, and this incredible imbalance between the acceleration in our technological capacities and powers and the very halting growth of our inner capacities such as wisdom and love and, and, and compassion. So we're in a lot of trouble. We're going to need all the capacities that uh, contemporary science and psychology and also ancient wisdom can offer us. We're, you know, it's, it's tough. It's going to be tough. And it makes me think about like what are those memes that could spread so quickly in a culture where we seem to love instant gratification and it takes a lot of effort. The truth is really complicated and also requires not knowing, admitting to not knowing, which is tough. So I'm wondering what are the memes that could spread more easily that wouldn't require someone to be really intellectual about it and you know, reading all these books to understand like integral theory. And is there just like a simple meme that could catch on like a belief, an idea that could be a healthy one that spreads? Liam, I think you're asking one of the most important questions of our time. And, and that question is, what are the most strategic, helpful, healing, growthful ideas we can put out into our community, which also have some uh, some staying power or attractive power or um, not coming up with quite the right word, but have have viral capacity and can really be reach out, reach as many people as possible. I think you know. Thank you for doing this podcast and getting some of these ideas out. But it's a this is a this is a really important question you're asking. What are the most one of the most beneficial ideas we can get out into the culture. So listen, at the, at the end of these conversations, I do a, a rapid fire question. So um, are you ready for some, some quick questions? So um, what's something most people don't know about circus acrobats? <laughs> well, in my case, they have a very, a very short career. <laughs> could you expect uh, i know it's rapid fire but um yeah but i mean you, you were a circus acrobat which i think is just the most fascinating thing i've seen on a resume what uh like ha what's the backstory there oh i was deeply into uh sports like uh, trampolining and diving so i tr <laughs> tried my hand at uh, a circus act and to my amazement, we got in there for a while, but it was it was a very brief uh, interim in my medical medical training. <laughs> I'll bet your contemplative practice must have helped with just like the the stress I imagine or the psychological pressure of performing in that context. Well, I, well, I didn't begin contemplative practice till many years after that, after I came to the United States and was doing my uh, psychiatry training. So that was a, a much later part of my life. So what, what's your favorite mental practice or tool that you use, um, either like a go-to meditation technique or something that's kind of your go-to practice? My main practices these days are in uh, 
awareness meditation, those kinds of meditation where one simply opens to one's experience and and uh, uh, just experiences it fully as possible. And I've come to discover that uh, what wise people have known for centuries that uh, if you just opened your experience and allow it to be there, then it tends to unfold and heal and release in beneficial ways. So uh, it's uh, beautiful to know one can simply be with a challenging emotion, for example, and let it be there and it'll just release and unravel and do its thing and heal. What's uh, the most incredible insight about the mind from studying it, either like first person or a fact that comes to mind? Oh, well, I think the great, greatest shock of my life was realizing how out of control our untrained minds are, that we are literally walking around in a kind of trance, and that until, that until we begin exploring the mind systematically, we don't even know that. And that's something that the great uh, sages and wise people have told us for centuries, that what we call normality is actually a form of uh, individual and collective hypnosis, and that we live, uh, each and every one of us, in the greatest cult of all, culture, in which we are entranced. And, and, we, and I'd say the other great surprise is that we have these potentials and developmental stages and capacities that are available to all of us, but we just haven't known about them in the West until recently. So that's an extraordinary and very positive, positive and optimistic uh, shock too. So the last one that I always ask is that you have a 15 second commercial that goes out to the world with um, just a message you'd like to leave people with. Well, I'd like to leave people with the message that uh, all of us have reservoirs of insight and wisdom and sensitivity and care and compassion within us, that those capacities can be accessed through practices such as meditation or yoga or contemplation or psychotherapy, anything which allows us to touch into ourselves. And those capacities can not only be accessed, they can be cultivated, they can be strengthened, we can mature, we can grow. There are ways of doing this. People throughout centuries and millennia have devoted their lives to providing us with understandings and techniques and, and technologies for coming to the fullness of our, our human existence and living at lives that are deeply satisfying and nourishing and fulfilling and joyful and enabling us to help others live those same kinds of lives. Those potentials are available to us all. We just have to take the time, turn off the television, you know, close the social media and spend and start to direct a little, little time to ourselves and to cultivating these capacities. We are not only more than we think, we're more than we can be. And, and as you said at the beginning of the conversation, like your first kind of big um, insider uh, just fascination with the mind, realizing that there's this fascinating inner universe. So it doesn't have to be, it sounds boring sitting there, but that, uh, that project is way more exciting than it may sound to someone who, who hasn't started on that journey yet. Once you learn to meditate, you never have to be bored. <laughs> That's right. Where can folks just learn more about your work or um, find your books? Yeah, thanks for asking. I have a website, drrogerwalsh.com, and there you'll find a lot of free information, talks, articles, uh, also information about my books, the ones we talked about, The World of Shamanism, Essential Spirituality. There are other books as well. Uh, so, yeah, please take a look and see if there's anything there of interest for you. Well, listen, this has been so much fun and uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation, Liam. All the very best for your good work.